Uh, the last time we were here, I don't think this was an issue because it became an issue in mid to late 2018 after Russell and Nelson. Uh, is, is that me doing the puff sound? You want, I'm good? Okay. When Russell M. Nelson became the president in 2018 after the death of Thomas Monson, you probably recall that he made quite a big deal out of the word Mormon, out of the phrase Mormon church, out of the word Mormonism and, and LDS. He, he uh, came out with an, an edict. Maybe I better change this out. Would that be okay? I'll go, I'll go to the handheld. And, uh, Okay, thank you very much. And uh, he made a big deal about people calling themselves Mormons or other people calling members Mormons. He said, don't use Mormonism, don't use LDS, and so certainly you don't call it the Mormon Church because that's not the official title of the church. I don't think it was any shock to anybody that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not known officially as the Mormon Church, but this was a big deal with, with uh, Nelson. And then in conference in August of 2018, he really kind of laid down the hammer and made it official that you're not supposed to do that. I just recently received an email from a Latter-day Saint wondering why after three years, basically what he was saying is, why haven't we gotten on the ball and started paying attention to Russell Nelson? Well, first of all, folks, Russell Nelson's not my prophet, Okay. Second of all, I think Russell Nelson is highly inconsistent by demanding that of his people, especially since a lot of LDS leaders use those very words to describe themselves. So if Russell M. Nelson is going to argue that when a Latter-day Saint calls himself a Mormon, that he's giving some kind of glory to Lucifer or Satan or ticking off Jesus, well, is that the way it's always been? And if so, what do you do with Gordon B. Hinckley, who wrote a book with the word Mormon in the title, and even inside the book, calls the church the Mormon church? Did not Gordon B. Hinckley know that he was kicking off Jesus? Did he not know he was giving glory to Lucifer when he did that? Apparently not. But I think this whole issue fits right into what I'm going to talk about tonight. When we ask the question, what is Mormon doctrine? Now, I'm not going to be using that word because I mean to be disrespectful, not in, not in any way whatsoever. But I, I just want to let you know, and this is a problem that we find when we're doing our radio show also, because we have like 12 minutes of actual content, a little over 12 minutes in each segment. And we're often making comparisons between what New Testament Christianity teaches and what the teachings are in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, if I were to use the official title every time I'm making mention of the doctrines of their church, I would guarantee you I would have Mormons writing me complaining that I'm mocking them. Because the title is so awkwardly long, to say that every time would would probably start hurting your ears after a while. So please bear with me. Give me a little bit of grace. Mormon can be said very quickly. LDS can be said just as quickly. And so I'm going to be making references to that only because, it really, I, I'm, well, quite honest, I, after 40 years of doing this, I'm not out of the habit of doing it, okay? So, but I'm doing it because it's quicker to say it. We get in, we get out. And I, I really do believe if I use the official title every time, it would just sound like I'm mocking Latter-day Saints. And I certainly don't want to do that. Everybody's familiar with that word, with Mormonism or Mormon and so forth. So we're going to try and, and separate, and that's how I put it, trying to separate what is official LDS teaching from what is folklore. And there's a reason why I think this becomes important. This is kind of a lesson for us to get a better understanding of where our LDS neighbors are coming from. So let's, first of all, start off with this and see if maybe you resonate with what I'm going to show you. Some common responses from Latter-day Saints when you're trying to talk to them is one, well, we don't believe that. Have you ever heard that before? You bring up something, you may have cited it right out of their own material, and they'll say, well, we don't believe that. Well, maybe that individual doesn't believe that, but that does not necessarily mean that their church does not teach it. Also, well, that's not official teaching. That's not official teaching. 
don't tell us what we believe. I think that is a general rule that we should follow. I think Eric made a good point that we never accuse the Latter-day Saint of what they believe because we don't really know what that Latter-day Saint might believe on this particular issue. They may be a convert. Maybe they weren't aware that the church they joined believes such things. So to accuse them of believing something that they personally do not believe, you can see, might be very offensive to them. That is why, as Eric said, we try to make a habit of asking questions to find out where they are coming from, depending on the answer they give us, is going to help us frame the next question. But we're always allowing them to defend themselves. And I find that this probably one of the least offensive ways of sharing with someone who does not agree with us. How about this one? Well, that isn't in the standard works. We have some within the LDS church that we probably label as minimalists. In other words, they think that their doctrine is only found in the standard works, that if we were to cite something from a leader uh, outside of the standard works, which is the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, that that's not fair game. We shouldn't do this. So just stick to those four books, and they would probably feel that we're going to be just fine, staying within the rules. But is that really the parameters that we are given by the church itself? Well, that's what we're going to look into. A prophet is only a prophet when he is acting as such. This is a statement that Joseph Smith, the founder of the LDS movement, made in uh, his home, I believe, when he was talking with two people that just happened to be visiting him. Did that become official? Having a private conversation in his home with two visitors? Joseph Smith made the comment that he was only a prophet when he was acting as a prophet. Now, all of a sudden, that becomes official doctrine? Well, we'll talk about that. And then we have this one. Well, that's just so-and-so's opinion. That was just Bruce McConkie's opinion or John Taylor's opinion or Brigham Young's opinion. And they feel that that opinion is not binding because opinions aren't considered official. All right? We'll talk about that as well. How about this one? Well, that's not Mormon doctrine. Now, remember, this, this is a phrase that I used to hear before 2018, okay? They don't normally say that anymore because Russell and Nelson said not to, and they fall right in line with what they're being told, which that alone should tell us something's weird here, something's wrong, because here you had a group of people that had no problem using that word before August of 2018, and then all of a sudden, overnight, it's sin? Think about that. What kind of groups do that? Certainly not Christian groups, okay? So, let's, let's go on here. This is a BYU professor, a man by the name of James Falconer. James Falconer did this, uh, I think it was an, an art article that was titled, Why a Mormon, remember this is before 2018, and here he is using the word, Why a Mormon Won't Drink Coffee But Might Have a Coke. The A Theological Character of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Now, James Falconer, Dr. Falconer, makes a very astute observation, I think. He said this He said, It is a matter of curiosity to many and an annoyance to some that it is sometimes difficult to get definitive answers from members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints to what seem like straightforward questions. Questions of the form, why do you believe or do X? Can anybody here resonate with that? He's recognizing that this is a real problem. You try to ask a Latter-day Saint what you think is a very simple question that can be easily answered, and they go all over the place, and by the time they're done, you don't know what the answer really is. And it's hard to understand people when they do that. I would hope that we as Christians can be very straightforward with what we believe, that we know enough of what we believe, that when someone asks us a pointed question, a straight question, we can easily respond with a pointed or straight answer. And I try very hard to do that because I want to be able to communicate what I believe as a Christian with those whom may disagree with me on the points that I believe. Well, let's go on with Dr. Falconer here. I think I've got something else here. Yeah, he has this statement as well. For a Latter-day Saint, a theology is always in danger of becoming meaningless because it can always be undone by new revelation. 
I think I gave you an example. Before 2018, the word Mormon was quite common. Remember two movies that came out a while back called Meet the Mormons? Was Thomas Monson making Jesus upset with that movie? We would have to assume that he must have. Unless, of course, that didn't be a, become a problem with Jesus until Nelson became president. Okay? But he says, it's always in danger of becoming meaningless because it can always be undone by new revelation. My point is a logical one, he says, to believe in continuing revelation, which the Latter-day Saints pride themselves in, is to believe that any account of our beliefs is logically in danger of being undone by new revelation. All one need do is look at the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we see what? Evolving theology from its beginning clear up to this very day. It's not constant. It's not constant. Christianity is basically pretty constant because we're always getting our information from the same source. I'm not saying that someone can misunderstand what's in that source or misinterpret what's in that source, but the fact is the source is always the same. It does not change. We go on. Let me give you a few examples of what he's talking about. Well, at least what I think he's talking about. Some examples would be plural marriage. Latter-day Saints in the 19th century believed that you could have more than one wife. In fact, Brigham Young said the only way that you could become a god or even a son of God is if you practice plural marriage. Latter-day Saints don't believe that today. That was, of course, taken away with the Manifesto in 1890. We also have this teaching by Brigham Young that was known as the Adam-God Doctrine. Brigham Young never called it the Adam-God Theory, as some apologists try to stick that word on that teaching. But he called it a doctrine. In fact, he even said that if you don't believe that Adam is God, you better pause before you treat this doctrine lightly or with indifference because it will prove your salvation or damnation. Latter-day Saints don't believe that today. They don't teach that at all. How about the priesthood ban? Were those of African heritage? Black members in the church of African heritage, if they were of that heritage, they were not allowed to hold the priesthood, either Aaronic or Melchizedek. And then all of a sudden, in 1978, that was completely reversed. Well, what do you do with that? It's evolving. This is exactly what Falconer is trying to say. Something that we think is true one day can be false the next day. Truth is always in a state of flux when it comes to the teachings of this church. Falconer's syllogism goes kind of like this. He says, Theology assumes the existence of a set of beliefs that it shows to be rational and coherent. Then he says, Continuing revelation reserves the right to radically restructure the LDS belief set. Then he says, So, an adequate theology and continuing revelation are at odds with one another. And then he concludes with, thus, since Latter-day Saints insist on continuing revelation, they cannot have an adequate theology. Now, coming from a Latter-day Saint, we better, we better take notice of what he's saying here. I wish more Latter-day Saints would take notice, because he's absolutely correct. And this is what makes it difficult for us as outsiders to try and understand our LDS neighbors. And believe me, if I want to communicate with my neighbors, I have to have somewhat of an understanding as to where they're coming from. And that's not always easy. It takes a little bit of study. It takes a lot of asking questions and communicating with them just to see exactly where they are coming from. Now, Sterling McMurrin was a Mormon philosopher. He's passed away since he said this, but he wrote, In the beginnings of the LDS Church, its philosophy and theology were quite fluid and in some respects transitory, a condition entirely normal for a movement in its infancy. In the early years, the theology was not basically different from typical Protestantism. And I might stop there because I think he's absolutely correct. And why is that? Because in the early years, a lot of the teachings that Latter-day Saints were learning were from the Book of Mormon. If you read the Book of Mormon, you're not going to get this picture that you're reading a story about ancient 21st century Latter-day Saints. 
And I've often used the expression that when I read the Book of Mormon, it sounds like I'm, I'm reading about a people group that are more like confused Protestants. And because a lot of the theology in the Book of Mormon is somewhat Protestant in its wording. It's not consistent, but you know what? That's exactly what I would expect if someone like Joseph Smith was behind it. Joseph Smith did not have a formal religious education, and he says some things that sound right on one page and then are all garbled and mixed up on other pages and take some things to extremes. And it's not a consistent theology, but it makes it worse when later on he starts having revelations that seem to conflict with what the Book of Mormon has to say. Eric gave you one example when he cited from Moroni 8.18 that talks about the God mentioned in the Book of Mormon as being God from everlasting to everlasting, that he's unchangeable. Well, Joseph Smith would come along later on around 1841 and say, we've imagined and supposed that God was unchangeable. He said, I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. Well, did he not realize he just refuted the Book of Mormon? He didn't see that. See, that's the problem when you don't tell the truth. You have to remember what you said before, okay? And we're not very good at that as humans. And the problem is, good, good prevaricators, to put it nicely, good liars, they usually don't give you a lot of details. And the problem for Joseph Smith is he did give us a lot of details, and he's not consistent with those details where we can start picking out the flaws in what he's saying, which shows that he's not being entirely truthful with us. So the theology was not basically different from typical Protestantism, but there were radical changes before the death of Joseph Smith. He says in the first decades of this century, this would be the 20th century, because as you can see, this came out in 1993, McMurrin said, in the first decades of this century, the philosophy and theology achieved a considerable measure of stability and consistency. But things changed after the death in 1933 of the church's leading theologians, Brigham H. Roberts, known as B.H. Roberts, and James Talmadge, who was a Mormon apostle. Now, for several decades, there, have been considerable confu- there has been considerable confusion in Mormon thought with the result that it is often difficult, if not impossible, to determine just what are and what are not the officially accepted doctrines. So you can see if, if there's confusions within the ranks, of course there's going to be confusion outside of the ranks. And, and it is hard sometimes to try and understand where our neighbors are coming from. This is a book called uh, Answers, Straightforward Answers to Tough question, tough Gospel Questions. It was written by a BYU professor. He, he's passed away now. This is Joseph Fielding McConkie. Joseph Fielding McConkie was the son of Mormon apostle Bruce McConkie. And in this book, he said this, It is not uncommon in gospel discussions for someone to challenge what is being said with the question, Is that official church doctrine? This question often means the one asking it does not like what is being said and is seeking a reason not to be bound by it. Well, you probably experience that when talking to a Latter-day Saint. You bring up something and they'll ask you something like that. Well, is that official teaching? But notice what Joseph Fielding McConkie says. The question is generally successful in putting the one challenged on the defensive because of the difficulties associated with defining official church doctrine. What are we to do here? We go on. In the Sunstone Magazine, and this was a magazine that I I liked Sunstone when it was around because I thought they were much more uh, transparent and honest about some of the problem areas of the LDS faith, uh, more so than the official publications that the church would put out. But David John Berger, and that's not David John Berger's picture on the cover there, but David John Berger had an article in this particular edition, the February 1985 edition of Sunstone, where he raises this question and then he answers it. What then do Mormons, again he's using the word Mormons, pre-2018, what then do Mormons now consider to be authentic doctrine? Ironically, there is no clear official answer. What do we do? What do we do? I I think this causes us a dilemma. Does that mean that we can't really say anything to our Latter-day Saint friends, that they shouldn't 
feel responsible to at least answer? Can they blow off everything that we bring up? Not necessarily, and that's the whole point of what we're talking about. Experience shows us that Latter-day Saints do, in fact, hold to certain beliefs. They do. They have truth, truth claims that they hold very dear. But the question is, where do they get them? Where do they get them? They don't just make them up. Well, sometimes I've had Mormons make things up, but not often. That's very rare. But I've had that happen. Um, but where do they get them? What sources can we cite that LDS members should respect? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I firmly believe, first and foremost, that the Bible is one of the best sources we can use in a witnessing situation. But sometimes you have to use their own material to get the Mormon to the point where the Bible's going to have any respect with them. You have to sometimes show them that if you want to hold on to your, to your beliefs, here are the consequences of holding on to your beliefs. Then I like to show them a better alternative. So I'm not saying that I'm trying to supplant the Bible. Don't, don't get that idea, because I'm certainly not. I'm always going right back to the Bible when I'm talking with a Latter-day Saint. But I find sometimes I have to give them a little bit of their own stuff to get them to start thinking about this. Now, Eric had briefly mentioned how the Scriptures for the Latter-day Saints are the standard works. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. But it's the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Well, what do Latter-day Saints believe about these? Why are they important to them, or should they be important to them? Well, this is a manual that was published by the church back in 1982. It's titled, uh, Teachings of the Living Prophets. The standard work should be used to judge the truth of all teachings, it says. Once a volume of Scripture is included among the standard works, it takes on added significance. It becomes a binding document which is part of the standard by which the truthfulness of all other statements can be measured. Now, you could probably get a, a, a Bible scholar to say something very similar as to what we read in yellow here when describing how we view the Bible. That the Bible is, of course, our supreme written authority. If we believe something that conflicts with the written Word of God, whatever we might believe or think needs to be rejected because the Bible reigns supreme. If there's a conflict there, we always go back to the Word of God. Well, this is basically what they're saying here, only it doesn't just include the Bible, it's also the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. Okay, but... Is that all? Well, this is Joseph Fielding Smith. He's the tenth, he was the 10th president of the church. He was the father-in-law of Bruce McConkie, the Mormon apostle. And he said in his book, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 3, page 203, the standard works judge the teachings of all men. It makes no difference what is written or what anyone has said. If what has been said is in conflict with what the Lord has revealed, we can set it aside. My words and the teachings of any other member of the church, high or low, if they do not square with the revelations, we need not accept them. Let us have this matter clear. We have accepted the four standard works as the measuring yardsticks or balances by which we measure every man's doctrine. Okay, if that's true, and we only go by the standard works, then why is it that the LDS church, at least during the lifetime of Brigham Young, were being taught and believed that Adam was God. That's not in the standard works. Why do they believe that there's a heavenly mother? That's not in the standard works. A lot of the theology of the LDS saints you're not going to find in the standard works. Much of it came about later on, and, or at least uh, clarified later on in a way that sometimes it doesn't sound like it goes along with the standard works at all. But it gets worse than this. Let's go on and let's see what Harold B. Lee had to say. He was the 11th president of the church. He said, It is not to be thought that every word spoken by the general authorities is inspired. Now, what's a general authority? Eric kind of explained that. You have the prophet president at the top, his two counselors, the 12 apostles, and the first quorum of 70. You have a lot of lower local leaders, but they are not general authorities. They cannot speak up to anyone higher than they are in authority. In other words, a 70 can't correct an apostle. An apostle cannot correct someone in the first presidency. No one in the church has the authority to correct the prophet. 
That's just the way it works. It's a top-down organization, top-down hierarchy. Okay, uh, so um, words spoken by the general authorities is inspired or that they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost in everything they write. I don't care what this his position is. If he writes something or speaks something that goes again beyond anything that you can find in the standard church works, Unless that one be the prophet, seer, and revelator. Please note that exception. So on one hand, Brigham Young shouldn't have taught Adam was God. But on the second hand, because he did, he has the exception. He can teach doctrine for the entire church. You see how confusing this gets very quickly? It gets very confusing very quickly. He says, unless that one be the prophet, seer, and revelator, please note that one exception. You may immediately say, well, that is his own idea. And if he says something that contradicts what is found in the standard works, you may know by the, that same token that it is false, regardless of the position of the man who says it. So, what we learn from this is that pretty much everybody in the church is bound by what is in the standard works, except for the prophet of the church. He can say whatever he wants. Does that not sound a little bit dangerous to you? That you can have an individual come into power, he can say whatever he wants, and everybody in the church is supposed to, gee, overnight follow his dictates. That's exactly what we saw in 2018. The Living Oracles. According to a church manual titled Gospel Principles. This is the 2009 edition. That's the latest revision that was made to this book. It says the inspired words of our living prophets are also accepted as Scripture. Okay, we were originally told there's four standard works of Scripture. Now we're being told that the inspired words of our living prophets are also accepted as Scripture. Their words come to us through conferences. That would be general conference held twice a year. The Liahona or Ensign Magazine. Now, note this was this was written before 2021, so naturally they are including the Ensign. But the Ensign Magazine is no more. They do not publish the Ensign any longer. The Ensign has been replaced by a magazine that's called the Liahona. Okay, the Liahona used to be another kind of magazine to meet the needs of a certain group within the LDS Church, but now that one has become, you could say, the official magazine for adult members in the church. And it's pretty similar, somewhat in content, uh, as the Ensign Magazine. Twice a year, they include the transcripts of the conference messages and such. But that's where you go to get your official, uh, official statements from the leadership. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you're going to see the Ensign being cited a lot. We do it a lot because there's just so much in the Ensign, and it's been, it was published for so long, you can just see the vast wealth of knowledge or information that is in it that we want to certainly get across to the membership as well as to those of us who are wanting to better understand our LDS friend. Well, what about General Conference? Why is it so important to the Latter-day Saints? Many people just look at it as, well, they're just getting together and the top leaders get up and give a 20-minute talk and, you know, everybody goes home and has a good old time. They do that for a weekend twice a year. It's a little more serious than that. This is Dieter F. Uchtdorf. He is now an apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But in the Ensign Magazine for March of 2012 on page 5, he made this comment. He said, listen to General Conference with an ear willing to hear the voice of God through his Latter-day Prophets. The voice of God through his Latter-day Prophets. I'm going to keep bringing this up because I want to make a point. When Brigham Young taught that Adam was our God and the only God with whom we have to do, that was a general conference message. Did that rule hold true when Brigham Young was the president? If so, was that God speaking through Brigham Young to teach that Adam was God. Now, Latter-day Saints today would say no. Well, would that mean then that they're not being consistent with what Dieter F. Uchtdorf said? He said that that's, that's the voice of God through the Latter-day Prophets when they speak in general conference. That sounds pretty serious. But yet, did you know a lot of the more heretical teachings of the LDS Church were taught in general conference? They were and it's not hard to find that out because many times they'll tell you it was in a general conference message. 
President Spencer Kimball, according to the book Teachings of the Living Prophets, this is the 2010 edition now, President Spencer Kimball, uh, who was the 12th president, also encouraged church members to obtain a copy of the conference issue of the church magazines and to make it a part of their gospel library. I hope you will get your copy of the Ensign or Leahona, now it would be just Leahona, and underline the pertinent thoughts and keep it with you for continual reference. No text or volume outside the standard works of the church should have, a, must have such a prominent place on your, uh, on your personal library shelves, not for their rhetorical excellence or eloquence of delivery, but for the concepts which point the way to eternal life. That's how important conference messages are to the LDS member. At the 180th semi-annual general conference, this was in 2010, the, there were two LDS general authorities. They were 70s. One of them was Claudio R. M. Costa and Kevin R. Duncan. They cited in this conference, point by point, from the 14 fundamentals and following the prophet talk that 13th President Ezra Taft Benson gave back on February 26, 1980. I, I have to be very upfront with you. When I, when I heard this and then I actually read it, I was quite surprised because the 14 fundamental speech was pretty controversial when it was first given back in 1980. I can only imagine how controversial it was when it was repeated by two, two general authorities in general conference years later. Think about this. Probably a lot of the people that were listening to this general conference back in 2010 weren't even alive or even members of the church when Benson gave that talk back in 1980. So this was probably fresh to a lot of them. But what did he have to say in this speech? What did he say that really makes it so controversial. Well, we're going to look at just a few of the points. Certainly, we can't go through every point. But point number one in this talk that Duncan and Costa went through is this. The first point, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. Supporting this premise, Benson cited Doctrine and Covenants, section 21, verses 4 and 6, which reads, Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me, for his word you shall receive as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith, for by doing these things the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Not only does he say that the prophet speaks for everyone on everything, that could even be political messages. Benson had no problem with that. He was the Secretary of Agriculture at one time under Eisenhower. Very political man. And uh, he felt that the prophet, even though he might not be educated in a lot of areas, whatever he said on it, you better listen to him. And he cites DNC 21 as his proof text that members should follow what the prophet says. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. Remember what Joseph Fielding Smith said about the standard works? Everybody better conform to what it says, except Harold B. Lee, who gave that exception that the prophet doesn't have to do that. The prophet can say whatever he wants. And here we find proof that the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works, which means if he conflicts with the standard works. You're still to believe the living prophet. Now, he tells this story. In this talk that he gave, he tells this very brief story where he cites President Wilford Woodruff. Wilford Woodruff was the fourth president of the church. Wilford Woodruff was the one who signed the manifesto, making plural marriage no longer a, a doctrine in the church, or at least I should say a practice in the church, because Polygamy is still a doctrine. It's just not being practiced today like it was in the 19th, in the 19th century. And what do I mean by that? Well, take Russell M. Nelson, for instance. Russell M. Nelson was married. His wife passed away. He was sealed for time and eternity to this woman. She passed away. He ends up marrying another woman. And he's married now to her for time and eternity. According to Mormonism, he has every hope of being married to both women in the next life. Not only Russell M. Nelson, but the second man in line to become the president, should 97-year-old 
uh, Russell and Nelson passed away. Dallin H. Oaks, same thing. He was married. His wife passed away. He marries another woman and is sealed to her for time and eternity. He also believes in the next life he'll be married to both wives. Polygamy is still a doctrine in the church. It's just not practiced quite the same way as it was during the 19th century. Wilford Woodruff tells of an interesting incident that occurred in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. I will refer to a certain meeting I attended in the town of Kirtland in my early days. At that meeting, some remarks were made that had been made here today with regard to the living prophets and with regard to the written word of God. The same principle was presented, although not as extensively as it has been here, when a leading man in the church got up and talked upon the subject and said, You have got the Word of God before you here in the Bible, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants. Now you might wonder, well, why didn't he include the Pearl of Great Price? Well, at this time it was not canonized, so that was not a part of the list. But he lists these three. He says, You have the written Word of God, And you who give revelations should give revelations according to those books, as what is written in those books is the Word of God. We should confine ourselves to them. Sounds pretty similar to what Joseph Fielding Smith tells us, right? Even though Harold B. Lee clarifies it a little bit more, giving that exception to the prophet of the church. Well, how did the people respond, or how did Brigham Young and Joseph Smith respond to that kind of a comment being made in in this meeting? When he concluded, Brother Joseph, speaking of Joseph Smith, turned to Brother Brigham Young and said, Brother Brigham, I want you to go to the podium and tell us your views with regard to the living oracles and the written word of God. In other words, I want you to answer this gentleman's objections. So Brother Brigham took the stand, and he took the Bible, and he laid it down. So just imagine in your mind's eye, he takes the Bible, he lays it down, let's say on a table. And he took the Book of Mormon. And, uh, and the book of the Doctrine and Covenants, and he lays them down before him. And then he says this, there is, written, there is the written word of God to us concerning the work of God from the beginning of the world almost to our day. And now, said he, when compared with the living oracles, those books are nothing to me. Those books do not convey the word of God direct to us now as the, as the words of a prophet or a man bearing the holy priesthood in our day and generation. Now what do we do? Well, what do we learn from all this? Well, when you have Brigham Young going on to say this, you can imagine this can be very confusing even to a Latter-day Saint. Brigham Young went on to say, I would rather have the living oracles than all the writing in the books. That was the course he pursued. When he was through, Brother Joseph said to the congregation, Brother Brigham has told you the word of the Lord, and he has told you the truth. Now, this was in a conference message, okay, 1897. And conference messages, as I mentioned, are very important to Latter-day Saints because this is when God is speaking through the church's prophets. So, are we to take this as gospel, if you will? What do we learn from it, though? What do we learn from this little story that was told by Ezra Taft Benson in 1980? Well, these are some things that we can take away from this. The story recounts the views of two of Mormonism's most prominent leaders, Joseph Smith, the founder of the LDS movement, and Brigham Young, the second president, a man who held the position of the president of the church longer than any other leader in this church's entire history. Not only that, This story was told originally by 4th LDS President Wilford Woodruff, who claims he was an eyewitness to what he heard and related in a general conference message in 1897. Then we also learn that it was retold by 13th President Ezra Taft Benson on two occasions. One, in a general conference message in 1963, and then later on at a talk that he gives in 1980. So basically what we have is we have four LDS presidents placing prominence in the living prophet over the standard works, not to mention the obvious permission from the leadership to allow this sermon or this talk to be repeated again in a conference in 2010. So is this what Latter-day Saints really believe? Do they really believe that the prophet can get up and say just about anything he wants? And even if it conflicts with the standard works, you are to go with what the leader says. Again, 
I ask you, does this sound dangerous? It should sound dangerous. It should really you know, bring horror to our thoughts, thinking that a lot of our LDS neighbors, if they believe this, imagine the kind of spiritual peril they could be putting themselves in by placing that kind of trust right now in a 97-year-old man. That's what's happening right now. Benson added in his talk, in the third point, that the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. And I would ask why. Why? If, in fact, as Latter-day Saints are led to believe that their prophets are there to guide the people into what God tells him to say, why can't we compare what a dead prophet had to say with what a living prophet is saying now? What's interesting is when this speech was repeated in 2010, citing Ezra Taft Benson's 14 Fundamental Speech, Ezra Taft Benson was dead. So when they say don't compare a dead prophet with a living prophet, I'm going to say to you they do that all the time. All the time. In fact, how many remember when they came out with a series of teachings of presidents of the church? They came out with a number of these manuals. They started back in the 1990s, and I think the last one was published in 2017. They were manuals that highlighted the statements of various past Mormon leaders. It was full of quotes from dead prophets. And yet, just recently, in Salt Lake City, we had a lower, a lower authority, not a general authority, get up there and basically tell this audience, don't go to the dead prophets, quote, only the living prophets. But yet, they do it all the time. How can you get away from that? Just in this last general conference, they quote dead prophets. Their manuals are always doing that. Beware of those, he said, who would set up the dead prophets against the living prophets, for the living prophets always take precedence. Why? Why? Could it be that Ezra Ezra Taft Benson recognizes there's a problem here? I think he certainly does. In point number 14, the prophet in the presidency, the living prophet in the first presidency, follow them and be blessed, reject them and suffer. Does that hold today now that Ezra Taft Benson's dead? You see, what is truth? What is truth? It becomes very confusing, even for the member of the church. The Encyclopedia of Mormonism, these were published back in the 1990s, gives some very good uh, definitions when it comes to certain subjects within the LDS church. But it says on, in Volume 3, page 1282, the inspired utterances of the president of, of the president of the church become binding upon members of the church, whether formally accepted as part of the canon or not. The living prophets' inspired words supersede and become more important to Latter-day Saints than the written canon or previous prophetic statements. Do you think that that may be why, and I was just commenting to Eric a while back on this, since Russell M. Nelson has become president, I noticed that a lot of his colleagues in general conference often cite Russell M. Nelson. In fact, it was said that one... Uh, no, I, I just read this thing and I, I can't remember all the names. But, uh, I think it was, was it Neil Anderson, Eric? Quotes, no, he said, quoted Nelson like 94 times in general conference messages. And it, it just seems odd. They're always citing Russell M. Nelson. Russell M. Nelson said this. Russell M. Nelson said that. He's, he's being cited constantly. He's sitting right there and they're constantly quoting him. It's almost like they're kissing up to him or something. Like they want some kind of position or something out of him, which they really don't need because they already have position, really, when you think about it. But they're often citing Russell M. Nelson over and over again. What happens when he dies? All those conference messages now become null and void? What do you do then? You see, you would think that if Russell M. Nelson is just the prophet that Brigham Young was, why can't we quote Brigham Young with just as much authority as the living prophet? Why, why all this nonsense about we can't compare a dead prophet with a living prophet? That makes no sense if they're true prophets of God. Now, I can understand some things can change over time, but in the LDS Church, doctrine is not supposed to be one of those things that changes. They say that's only for policies. 
And, and that even becomes more confusing, okay? Now, Reuben J. Clark was a member of the First Presidency in that manual, Teachings of the Living Prophets. This is in the 2010 edition. He makes this interesting statement. The question is, how shall we know when the things that they, the brethren, have spoken were said as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost? I have given some thought to this question, and, and the answer thereto, so far as I can determine, is... We can tell when the speakers are moved upon by the Holy Ghost only when we ourselves are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. In a way, this completely shifts the responsibility from them to us to determine when they so speak. In other words, if you disagree, you're wrong. As simple as that. My rebuttal to that statement would be this. If I, as a member of the LDS Church, have the discernment ability to know when my leaders are telling me something that's really inspired, why do I need them? If I have that ability, I should be able to know what's right without them having to tell me, and then me having to make a decision regarding what they have to say. And then we hear this, well, that's just their opinion. What do we do with that? Well, that was just that particular person's opinion. Like, that was Bruce McConkie's opinion or something like that. I've heard lots of these things on the streets. Well, in the Teachings of the Living Prophets Manual, 1982, page 21, prophets have the right to personal opinions. Not every word they speak should be thought of as an official interpretation or pronouncement. However, their discourses to the saints and their official writings should be considered products of their official prophetic calling and should be heeded. Eric was mentioning the miracle of forgiveness. Um, that same lower-level leader in Salt Lake City who recently said that we should not go by the dead prophets but only go by the living prophets also condemned the book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, written by Spencer Kimball. What's interesting, though, is that Spencer Kimball's book, as hard it is as it is to read, now, don't get me wrong, I, I hate the book. I mean, I, if... If that book's true, there is no miracle and there is no forgiveness. It's as simple as that. It's a great witnessing tool because we're trying to show the Latter-day Saints the impossibility of living up to what he has said in that book. And it is indeed impossible. But when you think about this, that was one of his, you might say, official writings. And his book was given a lot of accolades by other general authorities in the church some, even during general conference messages, they were telling people, if you want to know how to repent, read Spencer Kimball's book. Now, Spencer, book, Spencer Kimball's book is falling on hard times by some lower level people who just don't like how harsh it is. And this one in particular, he ins insisted, instead of reading something like that from Kimball, to read this new book on the divine gift of forgiveness by Neil Anderson, to read that book instead, because Neil Anderson is still alive. However, when you go through Neil Anderson's book, he never contradicts Spencer Kimball. In fact, in many areas, he basically repeats the same ideas that Spencer Kimball taught in The Miracle of Forgiveness, though admittedly, he's a lot nicer about it. But it still basically says the same thing. So the, the Latter-day Saint is still caught on these horns of a dilemma even though they are trying to make it sound like they're moving away from some of those past teachings, the fact of the matter is they're really not. What about LDS Church websites? In addition, information on official church websites is reliable and consistent with the doctrines and policies of the church. All materials on Newsroom and other church websites are carefully reviewed and approved before they are posted. In a complimentary way, Newsroom, LDS.org, and other church websites provide an official voice from the church. Now, I retrieved this on September 9th, 2021. Okay? Notice they're still using LDS.org. They're not supposed to say LDS. They changed that URL to now it's the church of, church of Jesus Christ.org. But here it is still on their website. In fact, there are a lot of articles that if you go on their official website, still use the word Mormon, still use Mormonism, it's still on there. It's going to take them 
probably till the millennium, to change all the times the word Mormon, Mormonism, and LDS is used on their official website. They're going to, their tech guys, their job is secure, okay? But I just want you to know, I just retrieved that on September 9th. That was not too terribly long ago, and they're still using some of the old terms there. That's got to be confusing for some people. Correlated material. What is correlated material? It's not a word that we often use, but basically it means vetted, that it's been looked at and approved by someone else. And in this case, it happens to be approved by the leadership in the church. A correlated manual, for instance. In 1960, the First Presidency assigned Elder Harold B. Lee to establish church correlation with the intent of coordinating and consolidating church programs, reducing overlap, and increasing efficiency and effectiveness. Now, this is according to the manual, Teachings of Presidents of the Church, David O. McKay, who is a dead prophet, okay? But that's what it says. That's what they're supposed to believe. And then we find this statement in another manual, Doctrine and Covenants and Church History Gospel Doctrine Teacher's Manual. This came out in 2003. Emphasized that church correlation was initiated and continues to operate today by revelation from the Lord to His prophets. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve oversee correlation in the church. Correlation includes maintaining purity of doctrine. Okay, if that's true, then we should be able to use church manuals when having a discussion with our LDS friends. What's great about the manuals is they've all been posted. They're all online. You can download them if you want. You can just print off a page if you like. But it makes for great material to say, hey, I read this in one of your manuals. Let's talk about this, can we? What, what does this mean to you? What, how do you understand what this, is, what this is saying? And how would you justify this? per se, with your standard works, for instance. These are open doors that we can use. They're giving us a lot of good material to use. Well, what about BYU professors? That's a fair question, because I opened up this whole session by quoting a BYU professor. Well, BYU professors are often readily believed by a lot of Latter-day Saints because they tend to say things that many Latter-day Saints want to hear. And you'd be surprised how many Latter-day Saints want to hear about grace that we have, that we can offer them. The problem is many of those Latter-day Saints who understand they need a doctrine of grace, a true New Testament doctrine of grace in their life, even if that's what they desire, the church is going to steal it away from them when they start looking at what the church teaches about grace. Because the grace to forgive you of your sins in Mormon theology, it only kicks in after you've repented of all your sins, confessed and forsaken them all, and you're keeping all the commandments. That's when the atonement kicks in to forgive you of your sins through that doctrine of grace. It's not that there isn't a doctrine of grace that enables you to keep the commandments, but that's not the grace that forgives you of your sin. That comes about later on, according to LDS teachers' teachings. But what about BYU professors? I, I've often said this. Um, well, Tertullian is credited, I should say. Tertullian is credited with coining the phrase, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? I like to add, what has Provo to do with Salt Lake City? Because many times what a BYU professor will say is not always in line with what the leaders are saying in downtown Salt Lake City. According to Ezra Taft Benson, this is in the book, The Teachings of Ezra Taft Benson, page 317, doctrinal interpretation is the province of the First Presidency. The Lord has given that stewardship to them by revelation. No teacher has the right to interpret doctrine for the members of the church. That sounds pretty blunt. If church members would remember that, we could do away with a number of books which have troubled some of our people. That's not a very flattering statement. But I think he's probably pretty right on that because there are books that have been written by BYU professors where I wonder, where are they getting this? Because it certainly isn't coming from downtown Salt Lake City. In summary, what should be good sources that we can use when speaking to our LDS acquaintances? For one, we know that we can use the standard works. That's been established. The Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of the Great Price, that's all fair game. If we open that, a Mormon can't just say, well, that's not important to me, or I don't believe that, that's just their opinion, or anything like that. They can't do that. Statements made by LDS prophets and apostles when speaking as an official spokesman for the church, that certainly would be 
in the next bullet point in general conferences. Now, think about this. When a, a president of the church writes a book, okay, now that's not something they are saying in general conference, even though they might be quoting themselves from a general conference, and that does happen quite a bit. But wouldn't you think, for example, when Spencer Kimball wrote The Miracle of Forgiveness, and, and that was published in 1969, and he said it took him about 10 years to get that book written. Do you think that Spencer Kimball thought very carefully about everything that he put in that book, or he just jotted down whatever came to mind? I think it was probably he thought very carefully about what he said. The way it's written, it sounds like he did. Well, if that's the case, then wouldn't that be kind of an, be an official, at least an official presentation of what Spencer Kimball was thinking? I would think so. Yet when Spencer Kimball became president, he never revised the book that he wrote in 1969, and it was republished while he was president of the church. He never made any alterations. He left it intact. He did say in one of his di- in his diary, I believe, uh, one of his relatives said that he kind of regretted that he was a little harsh in some areas, but he didn't really say that he would retract a lot of those things and make what he thought was sin not sin. He never said anything like that. So why wouldn't that be- book be a good source to go to, especially since other LDS general authorities put a lot of accolades upon that book and telling people to read it for themselves if they wanted to understand how to receive uh, forgiveness of their sins. We also know that we can use correlated church publications. These would be church manuals that come out, as well as church websites. And uh, speaking of church websites, how many remember Mormon.org? Okay, is that ticking Jesus off? I mean, I, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. All right, I'm thinking, did that bother Jesus because they had Mormon.org? And this is even another one I want to throw out to you. To get on the official church website now, you have to type in churchofjesuschrist.org. How many Latter-day Saints are still typing in LDS.org because it redirects to churchofjesuschrist.org? Is that a sin? And if it is, why does the church still have LDS.org directing to their newer URL? Is that a sin? Because they're not supposed to use LDS, but yet they are still using it. Type in LDS.org, you'll go right to the church's official website. Still doing it to this very day. So anyway, those are just some thoughts about what I think we can and can and should not use when we're talking to Latter-day Saints. Things that based on what we've read, should be respected by the Latter-day Saints. And so, if that's the case, then feel free to use it. And the material is out there. Now, it's going to take a little work, naturally, to to find some of these things. We've kind of made it a little easier for you. We have a lot of this stuff on our own website. You can go right to it. But this is why I think we've had many Latter-day Saints kind of respect what we do is because we do cite those materials, and knowledgeable Latter-day Saints have actually commended us for doing that. And if they respect those things, then let's use them. Let's use them. Let's talk about these things, and let's challenge the Latter-day Saint on what they believe. And uh, so, any questions on what we've talked about tonight? Anything at all? I know that we're a little bit past time, and, uh, but I still want to get you out of here somewhat on time. But any questions on this as far as what we should or should not do when we're talking with Latter-day Saints. Oh, wow, my, do- my job is done. This is good. All right. Question. Yeah. Um, not, I, I did in the beginning because I think it was just a hard habit to break. I think now after about three years, it's starting to become more commonplace, and Mormons do a lot of self-policing, where if they make that mistake in front of another Mormon, they get kind of you know, chewed out for that in a nice way. There are some Latter-day Saints who really object to this. One of them, I would say, is Jana Reese. Jana Reese is a, an LDS blogger. Uh, I think her blog is uh, Flunking Sainthood. We've cited Jana Reese a lot of times on our radio show. Uh, I, I actually appreciate some of the thinking that Jana Reese has, but she's been very critical of this. And after 
uh, Nelson made a big deal about this in General Conference. She came out with a pretty scathing article, basically ac- accusing Russell and Nelson of throwing Thomas uh, or Gordon B. Hinckley under the bus. Because Hinckley didn't have a problem with the word. He didn't. In fact, how many remember our Latter-day Saint neighbors telling you that Mormon meant more good? Anybody remember that? Okay. Yeah, well, that was a Gordon Hinckley invention, and he actually said that in General Conference. And it was the General Conference, after Russell Nelson spoke in the previous General Conference, making a big deal about the name of the church. See, this has been a pet peeve of his for a long time. It goes way back. Well, now he's the prophet. Now he can get his way. He couldn't get his way when he was a mere apostle in the church. Well, Nelson gave a talk on the importance of the proper name, and in the next general conference, Gordon B. Hinckley got up and kind of spanked him, I think, and and we're we're telling the people that we're never going to really convince anybody to use the official title. And besides, it's you know, we've been called worse, and he was kind of blowing it off like it's no big deal. And this is when he came up with that whole thing that Mormon means more good. Does it not mean that now? Did it only mean that when Hinckley said that up until 2018, and now all of a sudden Jesus gets mad about that, and Lucifer gets a victory? You see how silly this can get? And I think some Latter-day Saints probably do find it a little bit silly or not much of a big deal, but in general conference just a, a, what, a couple weeks ago, they made a big deal out of it again. They brought it up again, and we're hammering this home that you need to call the church by its official name and things like that. So uh, I don't think it's going to go away, at least while Russell and Nelson's alive. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't come right out and say sin, but he did say that it gives, it gives the devil a victory. I think it's a, a Satan a victory. Now, that sounds to me like a sin, okay? <laughs> and he also said that it, it's, uh, what's the word that he used? He didn't say tip off Jesus, I'm using that word, but basically it was the same kind of thing. Well, if it's upsetting Jesus, then that, wouldn't that be a sin? So it's kind of a sin without saying it's a sin. But Latter-day Saints, now they'll make a big deal out of it. As this person who wrote me just recently wanting to know why I'm not getting with the program, and basically, I think he's also hinting that we have to change our ministry name you know, because we use the term Mormonism. Well, back when I started this in 1979, that was perfectly legitimate. Nobody had a problem with it. And so we're not changing our ministry name. It's not going to happen. Okay? <laughs> Just let's know that up front. Anyone else? Yes. Uh-huh. And not only that, I was talking to Sharon, who works with us at MRM, and she says, didn't Jesus quote dead prophets? <laughs> I went, yeah. And it, I was, she was proofing an article I was writing at the time, and I had not included that thought. I says, can I stick that in there? She goes, oh, yeah, sure. So I did. I stuck that in the article that Jesus often quoted dead prophets. Was that wrong? What's wrong with that? Uh, we shouldn't have any problem with that. I think the problem is that LDS leaders know that their prophets are not consistent. They're just not consistent. And maybe they're embarrassed when we pick out those things and show them that they're contradicting each other, which proves they're not true prophets. They can't be pro- true prophets. And they probably recognize this. And so they came up with this cute little way of circumventing that problem. Uh, I personally, I don't think I want to let them get away with that. Uh, I think I want to hold their feet to the fire on that one because this is a pretty serious thing. And this is why. Let's take, for instance, the Adam God sermon. I keep bringing that up because it's, it's, an, easy, it's an easy one to, to attack. When Brigham Young taught that, he was a living prophet, right? And he was believed by people while he was a living prophet. And many of those people who believed him while Brigham Young was alive, some of them died before Brigham Young died, believing Brigham Young was telling the truth. Now the church says he wasn't telling the truth. So if that's true, and as Mormons are led to believe that God will not allow the prophet to lead the church astray, did not Brigham Young lead those people astray? 
So you can't have it both ways. And as I say in my article, I'm not aware of any obituary given to a past LDS prophet where it said he died because he led the church astray. They don't say that, okay? So obviously, it was believed when they were alive, they were telling the truth. Years later, they come to learn that they weren't telling the truth, which means they were false prophets. Anyone else? Yes. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at some verses that we can use to challenge our LDS friends. And uh, what, what's the other one we're going to do? Um, proof texting. Proof texting. Because a lot of Latter-day Saints will use certain Bible verses that they think supports their position. So I'm going to go through a number of these proof texts that you'll probably hear. And we're going to look at what those verses are really saying. So tomorrow is going to be more uh, of an evangelical theme to it on what we can use when we're talking to our LDS friends and, or how we can respond when they bring up certain verses that they feel supports their view. So I think you'll find that very helpful. No one else? I'll give it back to you, Pastor. Oh, one more. Yes, they do. They hold to the King James, but they also have, with the King James, the Book of Mormon, which is an entirely different type of book. It's not their Bible at all. Uh, it's a narrative regarding the uh, Nephites and Lamanites and has a story in it about Jaredites, three cultures, you might say. Uh, and it has a lot of theology in it, uh, in the Book of Mormon. And a lot of that theology that it has, as I was mentioning, is, is a bit convoluted in many areas. Uh, but there are a, a lot of verses that are plagiarized right from the King James. There, you've got the Apostle Paul being quoted before he was born, okay, and things like that, which shows that Joseph Smith is lifting them from the Bible and inserting them into the Book of Mormon and then trying to give his listeners the impression that this is an ancient book. Okay. Doctrine and Covenants is a collection of revelations that primarily given to Joseph Smith. Not all of them in the Doctrine and Covenants are to Smith, but most of them are. And they're also considered to be doctrinal positions as well. So, does that help? Yes. I, I don't know if it's really caused them problems. It may have caused them a little temporary embarrassment, but I, I think that was thrown out, though, wasn't it, just recently? They threw out that court case. So, uh, yeah, just, they would probably look at that as a blip, not a big deal, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how they handle money and things like that, like, talking about like a hundred billion dollars in that one account and over a hundred billion. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I, I think it was just temporary embarrassment. That it doesn't seem to be an issue now. It's going to go away. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I can't really say as far as the Mormons falling in lockstep with a lot of those things. Uh, there are some things that are happening within the Mormon church that are certainly sending a lot of the thoughts of the church more in a left position, a more liberal position, especially as the millennials are growing up and starting to take on local positions of authority and leadership. We could very well see a big change in that area. How much, I can't say. I really don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that has caused some questions even among some sincere members. They're troubled by that. But what do you do? You know, what do you do? You can imagine the difficulty that they're being put in. So, Pastor, I give it back to you, or you want me to? I'll give it to you.